Hello, everybody. Dr. Gwen here. Um, today, we're going to talk about constipation. So um, many people experience constipation, um, you know, every once in a while. Um, most people, I should say, um, experience every once in a while. Um, it's, you know, really when we when we think about constipation, we want to think about a lot of different factors, which we're going to talk about today. Um, but I also just really want to underscore the fact that it's actually quite normal um, to, to go through periods of uh, fewer bowel movements or harder bowel movements or harder to pass stools. Um, the definition of constipation is technically two or fewer bowel movements per week. So, uh, so that surprises people a lot that, that normally people are used to a daily bowel movement and that you know, sort of feels regular and then, um, but anything less than that feels constipated um, and often is associated with bloating um, and, and feeling, you know, just feeling all backed up like the name of this, um, this workshop today. So, um, so very often, you know, we're looking at both, you know, I don't really, you know, as much as the definition of constipation is fewer than two, um, two bowel movements per week, um, I really think about constipation as being when people feel like things are sluggish or they're you know, not quite uh, complete. And also what, if, when they feel like they're um, having any, any abdominal, you know, sort of bloating, discomfort, those kinds of things. Um, and that's relieved by having bowel movements. So, um, so yeah, so <clears throat> I might be a little bit more awkward today just because uh, I don't have any participants live. Um, many of you are watching the videos, which I love and, and welcome to the video. Um, I, I always say, you know, that's probably how I would be doing it because it's kind of nice to be able to listen and, and you know, uh, be able to watch or listen, um, you know, while you're washing your dishes or, you know, doing doing whatever it is that you're doing. Um, so. I, so it's wonderful that, that these videos have kind of worked worked with people in terms of their own schedules. Um, so today we're going to talk about just the, the, def, the causes of constipation, but also what are things we can do about constipation. Um, some of them will probably be things you're familiar with, but we'll be a little bit more specific about how they work and, and also how you can implement them. Um, so the most common thing that I see in practice is that constipation has to do with um, inadequate fiber intake, inadequate water intake, or inadequate um, uh, physical activity. So, and that, you know, that can happen for a variety of reasons, including things that, you know, are related to injury or um, illness. Um, and so, and then that, and, or medications that people take for, for injury or illness as well. So, um, so those are kind of the big three that, that I'm always thinking about first, um, before we, before we look at anything else. Um, the, some, another cause of, of um, constipation, chronic constipation, is really an intolerance to the milk protein, which is casein. Um, and so a lot of times people sort of identify that they have a lactose intolerance, which gives them these really immediate symptoms, but then they start eating foods that are um, lactose-free, and then they develop you know, constipation. Um, and so what often is happening there is that they have an a, a inflammatory type reaction to the protein that's in the berry. And so that slows things down it makes them tend towards constipation. Um, I've seen people, people with some severe constipation that resolved completely when they stopped eating um, dairy products, especially cheese, cheeses. Um, so also um, the, the bowels can move slowly for different reasons. One a major one is medication. So a lot of pain medications, um, some different medication, you know, lots of different types of medications can cause slower bowel movement or movement of the bowels and movement of the food through the digestive system. Um, also, thyroid disorders can can make people more constipated and can slow down bowel transit time. Um, pelvic floor muscles, um, as we talked about, you know, if, if that's something that's of interest or that you think that might be going on, you can kind of go back to uh, the previous, um, both the, the the class earlier this um, this month. Um, it was the uh, health class for grownups about the puborectalis muscle, um, but also back to the pelvic floor classes. Um, so there's a, this muscle that kind of wraps around the back of the, of the, the rectum that can, um, if that's tight, it can be really hard to pass a bowel movement. Um, and one of the best treatments for that is actually to raise your knees above your hips. So usually people use like a, um, a, a little stool or a squatty potty um, to, uh, to raise their knees up so that they get a better angle of their hips um, that allows them to, to pass a bowel movement more effectively and to stretch out that muscle. So um, uh, so that's definitely, you know, something, something to, to look into if that, if you feel like you're, there's other signs of, of tight pelvic floor muscles, which sometimes can be um, uh, symptoms like difficulty initiating urination, um, can be signs like pelvic floor tightness and pain, um, 
and uh, you know, and also sometimes this like feeling of a rectal fullness, but that it can't really pass. Um, so we can have a lot of different um, obstructive issues, obstructive issues that happen that cause constipation. But one of the more common one is is an obstruction kind of like near the end of the the um, bowels there. Um, so also small intestinal bacteria overgrowth is something that some people have heard of um, and some people haven't. So, so we can end up with a, a growth of bacteria in the small intestine, specifically the methanogens, they're, they're methane producing bacteria. If they overgrow in the small intestine, people end up with a pretty awful constipation. Um, and so, um, and, and that can happen. So there's a lot of back and forth happening right now in terms of a conversation about whether or not small intestinal bacteria overgrowth causes is the cause of the small, the slow transit time, or whether the slow transit time, the slow movement of bowels, is what makes an environment that's really good for growing extra bacteria. So, you know, that that um, uh, you know, if if you know, food matter is hanging out for a long time, and the bacteria is able to sort of keep growing and growing, that's where we can end up with an overgrowth. I think both are true. Um, definitely the thanogen bacteria, if you introduce them, they, they, they do actually slow down those motor complexes. So they slow down that 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 movement, that sort of squishing, that pushing movement um, that happens in the bowels. Um, and so uh, so we know that definitely that, and, and I also know that when we treat that, that constipation usually resolves um, or at least improves. So. Um, so we can say, you know, that that's definitely a relationship there. And, and sometimes that's something we need to address when the times that I think about small intestinal bacteria over, over bacterial overgrowth is when, um, people have quite a lot of pain and bloating. Um, so those are my two big, uh, big signs that there's probably some small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Um, so definitely something if you, if that rings true for you, um, you can talk to me or your provider about that as well to see if there's, that might be part of what's going on. Um, also too, that, you know, things like, um, stress can actually slow down your, your bowel transit because you, if you're in a sympathetic dominant state, so that's more of like a higher, higher intensity state, you know, which might even not be like feeling super stressed, but, you know, just responding to text messages and emails and, you know, running around and trying to get 10 things done in a day. Um, I can, I can also, you know, put your, your nervous system in a, in a kind of a place where, um, you're really the way I like to think about it is that when you when your nervous system is kind of having a higher stress response, it's shunting that energy away from digestion because it's kind of focused on getting you safe and getting away from whatever is chasing you or, you know, whatever stressor is there versus if the, the, you know, versus the, um, uh, uh, like sit, you know, resting and digesting, which is what the parasympathetic part of the nervous system does. So, all that to save stress can cause constipation. Um, so, and even, even the stress of like changing a routine, changing a, a schedule. So like, you know, you know, kids going back to school, uh, you know, traveling to a different time zone or to a different sort of scenario than what you're used to, um, you know, being in places where, you know, if, you're, if you have a time that you have a normally have a bowel movement, if you're suddenly having to be at work at that time, um, a lot of times people will get constipated because their body just doesn't really go, you know, enter that zone of, of, you know, resting and digesting and, and moving the bowels. Um, and so, so all that kind of change and stress and, you know, really can, can make a difference in bowel habits as well. Um, well a lot of people get very constipated when they're traveling. Uh, and that's both because of, um, we'll talk about some foods that, that are really constipating that, that often are a little bit more prevalent um, during travel, um, just because they're the easy to, to get foods, but also, um, also can be because of the change in, in schedule and the, like the, the little bit of stress that's present when, when traveling. Um, and when I say stress, I just mean change really. Uh, so stress can be good stress. Um, and, uh, you know, um, and whenever there's change, we can end up with a change in our bowel habits as well. Um, so water intake, um, there, you know, really there's a lot of people who are kind of pushing these really high levels of water intake and, and we have to be a little bit careful about that. You know, it is possible to get, to drink too much water. Um, and, and that can create shifts in your electrolyte balance and, um, in kidneys and, and can cause some, some problems. So, um, so we want to shoot for at least 48 ounces of water per day. That's the bare minimum. Um, many people need more than that. And, you know, kind of a good rule of thumb is half of your body weight in ounces. So, you know, if you, if you weigh 200 pounds, then you know, drink a hundred ounces of water per day. Um, but, you know, ease your way into that. You know, I don't recommend changing it really super quickly. If you're, if you're drinking 
like 30 ounces a day and then you go up to 100 ounces a day, you'll be spending most of the day in the bathroom. Um, so, uh, so actually just, you know, and, and know that as you do increase your, your water intake, you will spend more time in the bathroom um, urinating and, um, and that, that, you know, that will get better over time as your body sort of becomes accustomed to the, the more, the greater in water intake. Um, so, uh, you know, some good tricks for getting in more water. If you're sort of like, don't quite, you're not quite getting enough water and you would like to get some more, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard transition to make. Um, one is adding fruit to your water. So, you know, blueberries are really great. Strawberries. I feel like I always end up talking about blueberries, but there it is. Um, strawberries, uh, the, um, uh, there's these also too, as a little reminder, there's these little ULA, ULA strap things that can go around your water bottle that will flash a light at you when you haven't had a sip of water in half an hour. So it'll just give you like a little reminder that you need to, it's time to drink some water. Um, and, and lots of, you know, the, you know, adding like a little bit of fruit juice to water is fine. Um, adding, uh, you know, um, they have these new, like they have these cold brew teas that are actually quite lovely in, in water. Um, I know even Twinings is making one um, that's actually quite delicious. Um, and uh, you can get those at the regular grocery store and they're just made to be able to put in your water bottle. Um, and they have different like berry type flavors and things like that. So, um, and then fiber is also, you know, very important actually for, for staying regular and one of the, and, and, and for so many other things, we're actually gonna have another class coming up about all of the health benefits of fiber, um, which include, you know, hormone regulation, cholesterol regulation, bowel health, prevention of cancer. I mean, it, like it's a long list of things that fiber can do for you. And we'll talk a little bit more about like the specifics around fiber, um, but really, you know, trying to work those high fiber foods into your diet. So if there's a way to work beans into your diet, you know, half a cup of beans, um, I mean, what, what we do is we make a huge pot of beans for the, for the week. And then often just like add them to different, um, whatever we're, we're eating, we just add a little bit of beans to whatever it is. Um, you know, even on top of a salad, they're really good too. So lots of different ways to work in beans. Um, some of the most high fiber foods, um, are pears, avocados, lentils, um, the, um, you know, a lot of berries like uh, strawberries are, are pretty high in fiber, um, apples, oats, Oats are really high in fiber. Um, uh, and then sometimes people use things like chia and flax seeds um, to, to increase their fiber. The little caveat about chia seeds, if you're constipated, is to really to really ease into them because sometimes I, I've actually seen them create more constipation for people. Um, so and a great way to prepare chia seeds is uh, chia seed pudding. It makes a lovely, lovely breakfast, actually, um, or whenever. Um, you know, there's lots of great recipes online for chia seed pudding. Um, and then there's also shirataki noodles. Um, I haven't seen them around as much as they used to be, but they are those noodles that come in the little pack with the with the water in it. And um, those are just wonderful for getting a good dose of fiber. Um, and winter squash is great too, um, whether that's um, spaghetti squash or acorn squash or delicata. Actually, delicata is a really good this year. Um, just a side note. <laughs> um, the uh, you want to aim for at least five grams of fiber per meal. I mean, ideally a little bit more than that, but that's kind of the bare minimum for keeping yourself regular. Um, and, and if you are not sure how many grams of fiber you're getting because you're eating a lot of whole foods and they don't have labels, um, which is great. That's ideal. You can use my fitness pal as a tracker and that'll give you a good like overview about how, you know, what, what's happening with your, how, what, how much fiber you're getting per meal. So you can kind of see if you need to adjust that in any way. Um, so walking, kind of building, walking, more walking into your day is a great way. Also is really necessary actually for moving your bowels. So, um, and that can be, you know, as simple as like, you know, parking farther away and, you know, making yourself, you know, walk to, to the mailbox instead of driving, you know, getting the mail from, um, if the mailbox is far away, um, and is walkable, um, the, um, uh, you know, things, you know, really just going out for a five or 10 minute walk, meeting up with friends for a walk instead of meeting up for a meal um, is, a, is a great way to also get, you know, a few longer walks built into your schedule. But for the purposes of constipation, it's really about that consistency of, of walking more throughout the day. Um, so, uh, you know, even like even something as simple as like, oh, you know, you're carrying in some groceries, like instead of carrying the five bags all at once, you carry like one bag at a time, just go back and forth a little bit more. Um, those kinds of things actually will will help you um, with the, with moving your bowels. Um, there also are quite a few. Um, I'm going to actually share this screen. Um, 
there are some good yoga poses as well for um, uh, for um, for constipation. Um, we're gonna look at this from the uh, yoga yoga journal. Um, it has a lot of good pictures. That's why I chose this one here. Uh, so um, you can see this is the cobra pose, and that's that one is really good um, for you know, moving moving the bowels. Also, too, it makes me think about some of the points in um, Leilani's class or Leilani Navar's class from last week. So definitely check that class out for, with the acupressure, because also acupressure can be very helpful for um, uh, for constipation. Um, and this one too. Um, so any of these like kind of twisting motions, even if you don't feel like doing a fancy yoga pose, even just doing sort of twisting of your upper of your torso is a really great way to uh, to sort of support the bowels in their movement. Um, and then this kind of, this is just another twist position. So really kind of any of them that are twisting and you'll see the, the link to this in the handout as well. Um, and so, and this is, you know, you can see that so many of these are kind of a twisting type of a things. I think that for a lot of people with severe constipation, this wouldn't feel so good. Um, but, uh, but I can see how it would also help quite a bit. Um, so, and I've seen, you know, so this is, this is kind of like, you know, a pose that some people might not be able to do, um, even doing uh, like a child's pose and things like that can, can have a similar effect. Um, so, um, and that is, you know, just that kind of pulling your knees. This is like what we often do with babies of kind of like, you know, moving their legs. Um, I always think about that if this is, if this is a, a, what we're looking at doing. Um, and uh, so that's helpful as well. So just some ideas, you know, if you look up, um, I know Yoga with Adrienne has a, has a really has a good um, routine for constipation. Um, a lot of you look it up there. You could actually have like a whole yoga class online that is uh, geared towards treating constipation. Um, and and you know there really is you know in terms of um, uh, this kind of you know it's it's well basically any kind of movement is going to be helpful. And and also a lot of these yoga poses are quite helpful. Um, so. Let me see where, um, maybe that, okay, great. And then abdominal massage is another one that I find um, can be really helpful. And I, instead of, I realize that it's very, really, doesn't quite work for me to show you on myself um, just because of like, it looks weird in the camera and stuff. Um, so I'm gonna actually show you as a, there's a PDF, which again was the, is uh, included as a link on your, on your handout. Um, so of all of these, um, you can, so there's lots of different things you can do. This is the most helpful one that I've found, um, is that you basically just go, if you were looking at your abdomen from the front, like somebody was standing in front of you and looking at you, you're going clockwise. So you're going on your right side, you're going up and then you're going across the top of your abdomen and then down on the left side. So up across and down. And so, you know, really making sure that you're going with, so that that's to go with the flow of the bowels. So if you went up on the right, you or up on the left, sorry, you'd be, you'd be going against the flow of your bowels. So, so that's why you go up on the right, across and then, and, and you're just kind of doing like, some people use a little bit of oil or lotion um, and you can just go up and, you know, just sort of move, slide your hand along that track um, and just sort of, you know, keep on, keep on, keep on moving around. And you can go around a bunch of times too. Um, this one says for about two minutes, that seems like a good amount of time to me. Um, sometimes people do like a kneading, a kneading motion. So they kind of like use a, a rig of fists and they kind of like, you know, really kind of push, push. And sometimes they even do like an up and down like this kind of feeling movement. Um, and uh, so yeah, it definitely, um, uh, you know, or like a, or a kind of a circular sort of a moment movement. Um, you can, it's okay. You can't, you're not going to hurt yourself doing this. Um, and so you can, you can just kind of try that out. Um, this one where you actually take your, your hands like around from your back and kind of push them forward over your hips. Um, that's a great way to, to kind of like start you know, basically stimulating your bowel function. It stimulates the nerve. Um, so, um, and then also they talk about this one where you stroke upward. I've actually before seen this handout, I never have seen it before, but this is a NHS handout. Um, and I think, you know, so it's, it is, you know, evidence-based and I feel confident saying, you know, it's okay to do this. Um, I, these, this one, this is the most common one that we think about when we think about them most massage for constipation. Um, this one is a, 
close second. So, so that's a great handout if you're interested in doing, um, doing a little bit of abdominal massage there. Um, so, all right, great. And um, I was just about to ask if there are any questions. <laughs> like, probably not, because no one is here. Uh, so um, constipating food. So this is different for everybody. For some people, it, you know, yeah, it can be nuts and seeds. And for other people, it's, you know, but, but the most common ones I would say are cheese, unripe bananas, and foods made with white flour um, are kind of like the top of the list for most common constipating foods. Um, so even more so if you're having like cheese and bread, you know, which is or cheese and crackers, which is a common thing to, to have. Um, so, so really, you know, these, these are the foods and, and again, they're not constipating for everyone. So if you have constipation, it, it's worthwhile to try it two weeks without eating these foods and just to see if, um, uh, if you feel better. Um, so, and then, and then for a lot of people, you know, dairy being a major culprit in terms of all kinds of digestive upset, I think that, I mean, pretty much for most people with, with chronic digestive upset, it's worthwhile to do a two week trial without dairy, just because so many people have trouble either with the lactose, which is the sugar in dairy, um, or with the casein, which is the protein in dairy. Um, the, if they're lactose intolerance, they tend to have more gas bloating and diarrhea. If it's, if they're having trouble with the protein, it tends to be more constipation. Um, so, um, and probiotics are great for treating constipation, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. Um, the, you know, you can get those yogurt, um, uh, kefir, actually even the water kefir, um, which I've mentioned a little bit before. It's a really great one. It's easy to make at home. Sauerkraut, kimchi. Um, so you know, this is all, you know, always comes back to the microbiome also is that those good bacteria help us to help the bowels to move and also help because they're actually doing some of our digestion for us. And so they also help to kind of keep things moving in that way as well. Um, so, and then some foods that are kind of helpful as, you know, gentle laxatives are prunes and kiwis. Actually, surprisingly, kiwis um, outperformed prunes in um, a study. So, um, uh, peat prunes, it contains sorbitol, which is a, um, it's a sugar that it kind of gives, it has a slight laxative effect. Um, and, you know, with the caution of like, you know, for some people, they can get a lot of bloating and pain with eating prunes. So, um, so kind of ease into the prunes as well. And just to see if that's something that works well for you. Um, some people, you know, the, the therapeutic dose is considered seven prunes two times a day. I, I find that people actually have uh, relief even for with quite a few like less than that um, so like about I usually start with like two or three prunes a day and see see if that makes a difference um, so prunes are a great thing if you if you know that you're either taking a medication that kind of makes you more prone to to constipation or if you're you know especially in that kind of like um, 70 to 80 to 90 year old um, you sort of as um, the, as things kind of slow down uh, from, from your, as your bowels slow down, um, also prunes can be a really helpful thing to just sort of incorporate. If you like kiwis better, that's even, that's also great. Um, so, um, so yeah, they, apparently they work better. I actually don't know what the sugar is that they have that is a little bit of a less laxative effect, um, but really just one kiwi a day can, can make a difference. So, um, so, you know, that's kind of everything that you can do at home for constipation. Um, you know, there are natural medicine, gentle laxatives, but on this, for this class, I just kind of left off the, um, the, any kind of a laxative type thing, because there's so much you can do without having to take anything. Um, the, um, you know, and, and really, really also to, to just my, my little word about laxatives is to watch out for uh, stimulant laxatives can be um, habit forming. So, and, and that includes senna. Senna is a stimulant laxative. And so um, I don't like, I don't like to encourage people to, to take senna um, unless, unless they have kind of a long-term condition that requires it. So, um, because, because it, then it's habit forming. So then that means it's hard to come off of. And, um, and especially if people take it for a long time, they might like never quite be able to come off of it. So, um, the, if you, you know, in terms of when does constipation become an emergency, um, definitely if you have any kind of very severe abdominal pain, that's, you know, no matter what is going on with your bowels, you know, it's, it's a good reason to go to the ER. Um, like if you're doubled over in pain, if you're, if you're having quite, you're not able to do your regular life things because of the pain, um, it's good to, to get seen quick, seen in the ER usually. Um, the, um, 
if you have blood in your stool, um, you know, that there's a lot of different ways that people can have blood in your stool. The first thing, actually, all of the, the most, most um, office clinic staff are kind of trained to ask some people a question if they say that they have blood in their stool, which is, have you had beets lately? So, so just keep that in mind, is uh, that often people, it happens about three or four times a year that people call um, here at our office and, and say, oh, I have blood in my stool. And then the, the have you had beets lately? Oh yeah, I did actually. So anyway, just kind of know that that's a possibility too, but there's there, you, you can have blood both because of, of hemorrhoids and anal fissures. So that that's like blood on the toilet paper, or you can have blood that's mixed in with this tool. And that's really where, you know, it's more of like a, you know, it can be an inflammatory type of a thing. Um, it can be, uh, you know, a lot. You know, um, and then the more external, like the hemorrhoids and the anal fissures, uh, sometimes, you know, get better on their own and sometimes require a little bit more intervention. So, um, so if you have pain and you have blood, you definitely get to, if that's like mixed in with your stool, definitely get to, or if it's a lot, it's enough to like change the water a different color, uh, definitely get yourself to immediate medical attention. Um, uh, the, um, also, you know, if you're experiencing pain with bowel movements, it's a good idea. It's not really, it's not, that's not emergent always, but it, it or it's not, it's often not emergent, but it's uh, it can be that there's again like the, the tight muscles can be an issue, or um, or it can be that there's a hemorrhoid, or it can be that there is um, an anal fissure, or uh, um, or a, a mass, or anything like that that could be happening there. So definitely, definitely, you, you know, pain, bowel movements should not be painful, and if they are, it's worth worth getting checked out. Um, and then also like if you're vomiting with the constipation, like say if you. You, if a person has not had a bowel movement in a little while and they're vomiting and they're not passing gas, that would be a very strong reason to get to seek immediate medical attention. Um, so yeah, so that's that's really all that I have for today for constipation. And um, thanks for tuning in. <laughs> and uh, I'll see you all next week when we're talking about fiber. All right, bye-bye.